So this is part two of chapter one, uh, and I'm starting this with homeostasis. Now, if you look at the word homeostasis, you see two words there. You see the ohm and static, all right? So homeostasis simply discuss how we keep the home in a static environment. How we keep the home, the environment of the home, in a static status. So now when you go to the hospital, the first thing they want to do is to check your vital signs, all right? Now, what we call the vital signs, they check your temperature, particularly during this time of COVID, before you enter anywhere, they're going to put a scanner on your face, or the temperature scanner on your face, and they're going to check the temperature on your forehead, right? Now, they check your blood pressure, they check your blood pressure, all of those things that they check, they are vital signs, and there are ways that your body must be kept within a particular range, all right? Now, that is what we call homeostasis. Now, the system that regulates that in our system is the homeostatic system, all right? And I'll be talking about that. So, those are regulated predominantly by the nervous system and the endocrine system, all right? Now, uh, so homeostasis are ways that we maintain the internal environment of the of our system, and um, example of that is what you see in blood sugar, in temperature, your body pH, your blood sugar, your blood calcium level, all of those blood pressure, all of those are homeostatic uh, measures. So there is a set point which is the ideal point where he should be whereas there are also a range there's a range all right so your blood your temperature for instance now have a range your blood sugar have a range your blood um glucose have a, your blood pressure have a range all right now let's go now the nervous system like i said and the endocrine system are the ones that control homeostasis predominantly all right the nervous system controls by sending impulses to the brain and then the spinal cord, and also then to the effector. Now, what are, who are the effectors? I'll talk about that. Then the endocrine system control your homeostasis by regulating hormones secretion uh, of the endocrine gland. Now, so we have feedback mechanisms. So I'm going to talk about effector, all of that now, right? We have what we call feedback mechanism. Now, feedback mechanism is simple, and I'm going to analyze it using the thermostat in your home. Now, in my house, I have two thermostats, and there is one thermostat on the upstairs, there's one thermostat downstairs. Now, the thermostat upstairs is to detect the temperature upstairs. However, there is an area where the thermostat is very close to. Where that thermostat is close to is what is actually going to, that is where it's going to judge, make his judgment of temperature from. Now, so there are two rooms that are closer to the thermostat, whereas the thermostat is outside the room in the middle. Now, I notice the two rooms are usually cooler than what the thermostat projects. Because by the time the thermostat pick up the area, the temperature in that area, the thermostat gets a feedback that the temperature is already 75, whereas the room may be at 72. So feedback is what tells the thermostat when to start working, either to cool the hair or make the hair hotter. Now, so... That is how your thermostat works. Your thermostat works based on the, the, the feedbacks that it gets. However, you will notice that some places in the home are usually either more cool, it's usually cooler or hotter because the thermostat does not pick signal directly from that area. That is why it's always good sometimes to leave some doors open in your home because the thermostat will only pick feedback based on what it senses in the area that is closest to it. All right. Now, so that is the feedback mechanism. All right. So the same thing there is feedback mechanism inside in your body. The there is a there are some units in your body that brings feedback and tells the body start working, don't start working. There are feedback mechanism that 
detects when there is high temperature in your body, that detects when there is high blood sugar, that detects when there is high blood pressure in your system, and it brings the system to work or not to work. Now we have two kinds of feedbacks, which I'm going to talk about soon. Now, so feedback as cycle of event by which the homostat is, is maintained, it's just the same way I talked about the thermostat. Now, so what are the components of the feedback mechanism? All right, I'll talk about the component and I'll go ahead and talk about the types. Now, the component is you have a receptor. The receptor is, with, is actually the part that senses that there's changes. So in actual sense, you can think about the, the, this, the detector in your home as, so the detector of changes could be like you feeling the temperature or how the thermostat senses in the area. So the detect, the receptor rather, is the point, so it senses changes in external and internal environment. So think about yourself now, your detector, your receptor will be like, let's say the skin, feeling like temperature is high. So how does the body knows that the temperature is high? Your brain works with the skin. All right, so the skin feels the you feel like there's temperature and you don't have to do anything immediately the message goes to the brain that temperature is high because the skin is feeling it all right so they work together now so the receptor is the one that sees the changes all right now the control center is the one that evaluates the input from the receptor and detail the required changes so that's the brain the hypothalamus so control center will always be the hypothalamus. That's a control center. It will always be the hypothalamus. Then the effector is actually the one that makes the changes. Now, the brain does not make changes. The brain gives other for changes to be made. The brain regulates your system to give to activate the effector that will make the changes. So don't ever think the hypothalamus does everything. No, it's like a manager. It's like the it's like the thermostat. The thermostat is not what makes your home hot or cool. It is the AC unit that does that. The AC unit is the effector. The thermostat is the control center. All right. Now, the same thing as a receptor, sometimes you feel like temperature is high, then you go to your thermostat and set your thermostat to a particular temperature. You receive the signal that temperature is high, then thermostat does the work to regulate and send message to the effector, which is a AC unit or the heating system to power to regulate that temperature. Now, so don't ever think the control center is also the effector. That's what my student makes sometimes. So this if control center is the hypothalamus, the effector could be your muscles. All right. The effector could be pancreas. So effector are either organs or muscles. Let's go. Now, two types of feedback mechanism. This is very exciting, and you're going to see it. Very interesting part of it. Now, there is what we call the positive feedbacks and the negative feedback. And I'll talk about the negative feedback first because that's the predominant feedbacks in our system. Now, the fed negative feedback has a definition. And the definition is that when the response, think about it, response, response, look at this, receptor. Now, so what when what is being received is saying, stop, there's a danger. That is negative feedback. Now. So, this is it. If your blood pressure is going high, and immediately the hypothalamus says, says that the blood pressure is going high, what will the hypothalamus do? The hypothalamus is going to make moves to reduce the blood pressure. Because the response, because the, what the hypothalamus senses as a response, it's something that hypothalamus need to work against, all right? Blood sugar is coming up, hypothalamus says shut it down. This is a contrary movement. That is what, why we call it negative. Negative does not always mean low. It only means they are working in different direction. Now, if blood sugar is going low, what will hypothalamus, hypothalamus do? It's going to say, let's bring it up. 
it is also negative because it's not moving in the same direction. So the idea of negative is that they are negating each other. They are moving in different direction. They are contrary. They are counteracting each other. That is why we call it negative. So negative does not mean minus. Negative does not mean low. Negative means opposite each other. So let's say blood sugar, for instance, now is going low and the blood is a receptor. Hypothalamus senses that blood sugar is going low. What is going to happen? Hypothalamus is going to say, pancreas, send message to pituitary gland and say, okay, we need the pancreas to secrete. Uh, blood sugar is going low, right? So we need the, blood, the, the pancreas to secrete a glucagon. And immediately, glucagon will be secreted, which is the hormone that will raise blood sugar. Once glucagon is secreted, what's going, to what's going to happen? Blood sugar that was going low before is going to jump up. That is negative feedback. On the other hand, if blood sugar was going high, what is hypothalamus going to say? It's going to say, pancreas, you are the effector. Secrete insulin. Then insulin is going to come and bring the sugar lower to normal range. That is still negative feedback. So negative feedback simply means they are going in opposite direction, either up against it or down against it. They are still negative. Now, so blood sugar, calcium level, um, temperature. Now, so when you feel temperature, for instance, now, your temperature, what is the receptor in that case? Is the skin. The skin receives the signal that temperature is high. Now, what is the control center? Hypothalamus. Now, what is the effector? Effector could be the sweat gland. Now, you know what is going to happen? Immediately, when the temperature rises, what is going to happen? Hypothalamus receives the signal and says, temperature is rising. And that means we need to let out some heat into the environment so that the heat inside does not increase. Then what is going to happen? Hypothalamus is going to say, now let's release a lot of blood to the sweat gland. And now there's going to be vasodilation to the sweat, sweat gland, and sweat gland will be releasing a lot of heat out. That is why we sweat when there's high temperature. Now, if temperature is low, like now it is freezing in my office, what is hypothalamus going to say? The skin detects it and say, oh, Professor Hay is, is shivering. Then hypothalamus is going to say, okay, let's protect Professor Hay, so that the internal temperature does not go as low as the 84th Fahrenheit, or what's the temperature in this room? Let's say the temperature in this room is, um, is um, let's say, 20. So let's say the temperature in this room is 20 Fahrenheit. So he's going to say, now the temperature inside Professor Hay should be about 98.6. Don't let it go as low as 20 Fahrenheit. Um, now, so what's going to happen? Then hypothalamus says, we draw blood from the sweat gland. Don't let the sweat gland sweat. And that's why you notice you have goosebumps. It's as though the follicles are covering. The area is covering so that there's nothing going out. So it conserves the heat within. Does that make sense? So the sweat gland becomes the effector in that case. Hypothalamus is the control center and the skin is the receptor. All right? Now, so what is positive feedback? All of the things I've explained, they fall into category of negative feedback. Now, what is positive feedback? Positive feedback simply means that when hypothalamus sees the results, the results of that process intensify the process again. Now, positive feedback again is when the result of a process intensify the process. Remember that in negative feedback, the result of a process antagonizes or stop the process. So result of a process stops the process in negative feedback. The result of a process in positive feedback increases the process. So every results reinforce the process. Every result reinforces the process. Now, when does that happen in our system? It's a limited area. The first page, which is predominant that it happens, is pregnant in delivery. When a child is, when a woman is going to labor. Now, 
what tells the body that it is time to have a child? You see, it is the time when the baby, when the fetus is pressing too much into the cervix area, and it is now signaling that now it's time for the baby to come out. What is going to happen? The body starts to release. The brain starts, the hypothalamus on the posterior side of the hypothalamus begins to release oxytocin. Now, as the posterior, I'm going to write oxytocin here so that you catch it. Right? So the body begins to release oxytocin. The brain, posterior side of hypothalamus, release oxytocin. That oxytocin is going to, the job of oxytocin is an hormone, and what it does is to help to uh, contract, um, it helps to, uh, it acts on smooth muscles. All right, so oxytocin help with contraction of smooth muscles, right? Now, so what happens is as the hormone comes in, it acts on the cervix and causes the cervix to contract. So that's why we say the cervix is dilating. We say dilation is one, is two, is three. Now, the more the contraction, when the brain hears that, okay, there's contraction, the control center hears there's contraction. If it is where, if it were to be negative feedback, it will say contraction is dangerous, let's stop it. But now it is not dangerous. The body actually want that baby to be held. All right. So the moment there is feedback that there's contraction, now feedback goes to the thermostat, to the hypothalamus that there's contraction. What is it going to do? It's going to say, yes, that's what we are looking for. Release more oxytocin so that there will be more contraction. So more contraction leads to more release of oxytocin. More contraction leads to more release of oxytocin. More oxytocin leads to more contraction. More oxytocin, more contraction. More contraction, more oxytocin. That keeps going in that cycle. And that's why you look at the chart when a woman is in labor, you see that the contraction keeps increasing. It keeps increasing until the time the baby comes. When, there is no, when the baby does not, until the baby comes, Contraction keeps increasing, oxytocin keeps being released, and that continues all through the process. That is positive feedback. Another area where you have positive feedback, which is this same hormone, oxytocin, is when the baby is latching on the nipple to get milk. The more the baby latch, which is the receptor, where the stimulus comes, right? The more the baby latch is the more Oxytocin is released by the brain, hypothalamus, posterior hypothalamus release oxytocin, and then oxytocin will oxytocin will lead to contraction of the muscles, the mammary gland, and then the milk is released. The more the baby latch, the more oxytocin it produces, the more contraction. The more the baby latches, the more oxytocin, the more contraction. It's a positive feedback. The result of a process, contraction does not say no more oxytocin. That will have a negative feedback. But contraction will always say more oxytocin. More oxytocin, more contraction. That is positive feedback. If you have questions about this, please ask me and I can do a different video about it or hand sight when we meet. Now, when there is imbalance in homeostasis, that is what we call disease. The thermostat cannot regulate the temperature inside. That means there's a problem with the AC unit. All right. So the same thing when there's a problem with the homeostatic stage uh, system, that is when there is fever. That is when there's high blood pressure. That is when there's blood sugar increase. If there is any issue, that's when there is hypoglycemia. That's when there is um eye metabolism that we call hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism it's because there is a negative there is an issue with the homeostatic system um you notice the symptoms or signs now if it's now becoming so much think about it if there's high blood pressure and it's not becoming regulated it's not becoming controlled then it's going to lead to death if there's blood sugar and it does not get under control, it's going to lead to that. All right. So that is that.
Now, so I'm going to look at body positions now. I'll do this very briefly in about 10 minutes. I'll be done with it. Now, body positions. Now, when you go to the hospital, the doctor asks you to lie in a supine position. Supine position, and I joke with it, and I say supine, supine, supine. I say supine, up, all right? It is when you see this, supine position is, there is up there, all right? The doctor says, everything should face up, all right? So you lay in a position, your head is facing, your face is facing up, your palm is facing up, your toes are pointing forward, that is putting upward, that is a supine position, all right? Pronation is the opposite of that. That's when you lay face down and everything is face down. <laughs> That is supine. Pro that is pronation. Then erect is when you are standing. Uh, you are in an in court supine position, but you are standing upright. Erect. All right. So regional names. I will still. I will talk about these on different pages as we go. But you can look at it there at a glance. Now directional terms. Those are things that. Those are words that we use to describe direction. So you have superior. You have inferior below. So you see the eye is superior to the mouth. Um, the nose is inferior to the eye. All right. So you think about it in that order. Then you have um, you have right and left. Obviously, you know that. You have um, media. Media simply means it is closer to the middle. So this is the middle. All right. So you say that. Um, this is located media. Now, the idea of media is this. Now, whatsoever is closer to the middle is media. So, you know, here you have your, here you have uh, radius and you have honor. So, you know, there are two bones here. So, you have the honor, you have the radius. So, radius is closer to the middle. Honor is away from the middle. So we call this radius. So the idea of radius is the radius is closer to the middle. Honor is is away. All right. So that's the meaning of media. We say media, media. Uh, pro lateral is away, right? Prosima means close. All right. So when you're looking at this now, uh, you are looking at, you are you looking at it from the Point of attachment, right? So this is the point of attachment of your upper limb. So your elbow is proximal to the shoulder than the wrist. So the wrist is distal, the elbow is proximal. Proximal means near, distal, distance. All right? So this is proximal, this is distal. All right? That, that. Uh, anterior is the same thing as ventral. So I just call it AV. You know, we are still going to talk about AV node later anyway in AP2. So I call it AV. Anterior is the same thing as ventral. So these are, these are ventral areas. So when you're talking about uh, the cavities, we talk about ventral cavity and dorsal and dorsal cavity. All right. Um, let me go real quick. So we talk about this anterior posterior. Ipsilateral, contralateral. Ipsilateral simply means ipsilateral simply means it's on the same side. So this upper this upper limb, my left upper limb and my left lower limb, they are ipsilateral, and these are contralateral. All right. So sections. This is I'll be very fast now. Section. This is. Any division that cuts the body into right and left, we call it sagittal, sagittal all right? That's the sagittal. And if, if it's now cut into equal size, right? Right, equal right and equal left, we say mid sagittal because it cuts at the middle. Then parasagittal means it does not cut at the middle, let it cut somewhere here. And this right side is not equal to the left side. That is mid parasagittal. Then uh, any division that cuts it into front and back, we call it corona, not coronavirus. It's just corona section or frontal section. Then uh, transverse, transverse or horizontal, that's the way you cut your orange, it's transverse or horizontal. Then body cavities, that's the last thing I want to talk about, which is very, very important, very, very important. Now, body cavities, body cavities simply means 
areas inside your system that have holes and contain organs. The organs that are inside body cavity, we call them viscera organs. I'm going to type it here. We call them viscera organs, all right? Viscerals. So you just call them viscerals. Those are organs inside cavity. So my heart is a viscera. My um, lung is a viscera because they are viscera organ. Brain is a viscera because they are inside bony cavity, all right? So they are ventral body cavity, which means cavities are the frontal area, all right? So you think about thoracic cavity, which is the chest area that have the lumps, 